This podcast is for mature audiences only. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to From Crime to Crime. Hey, buddy. How's it going? I'm fine. Nobody cares. Let's just get right into it. (laughs) Before we get into it, I do want to say thank you to Dawn for suggesting this case to us. She lives in Kansas, and she's really interested in this one. So thank you, Dawn. Who's Dawn? Your old babysitter? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but she doesn't want to be known as my old babysitter, so you're not (laughs) supposed to say that. I got news for you now, Don. Now we all know that you're Erica's old babysitter. (laughs) No, she's more like an aunt. Well, aunt babysitter, Don, we love you. (laughs) We do love you. All right, let's get into this. Don wants to hear this one. It starts in October of 2011. 2011, I'm going to say Luke Bryan. No. Jason Aldean. No. Okay. It starts Um, with an R. Oh, Rodney. Um, yes. What, well, what is his name? Rodney Atkins. Yes. Yeah. Look at me. Do you know what song though? Um, there's one in every town. No. Does he sing that song? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there's one in every town that brings the party in us out. Good time, Charlie, from the bar. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think those are the words, but you're close though. I think. Um, no, nice. it's a uh, right. take a back road. Oh, well, can you sing that one? Not for the public, but I could sing it for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Give the people what they want. It's kind That's of why exactly like the one that you just did. But instead of saying like, there's one in every town, just go take a back road. <laughs> oh, right, right. You know. Take a back road. Yeah. Down the dirt road. Yeah. They're yeah. all the same. Yeah, pretty much. So we're going to go to Kansas City. Missouri? I'm pretty sure. Or Kansas. I don't know. Okay. One of them. <laughs> Kansas. They're like the same city, though, right? Just on on the line, on the water. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, one has the Royals and and the Chiefs, and the other doesn't. I think. Well, this one is on the Missouri side of the river. So there's a lady named Debbie, and she's a stay at home mom, and she's married to a guy named Jeremy, and they have three kids. So Jeremy had a son when they got married, and Debbie had a son. Then they got married, and they had a baby named Lisa together. Okay. Jeremy's an electrician and Debbie's a stay at home mom. So I'm going to give you like a little timeline of October 3rd, 2011, of the events that lead up to this problematic situation here. So Jeremy got home from work around two or three in the afternoon, hung out with his kids while Debbie and her brother went to the grocery store. On surveillance from the grocery store, they were seen buying baby wipes and food and a box of wine. So like totally normal shit to buy at the grocery store. (laughs) A box of wine. Oh, uh, yeah. So Midwest. Yeah. So Debbie and her brother got home from the grocery store, and then her brother left at around 5 p.m., and Debbie made dinner for her family. They all ate dinner, and then Jeremy had to go back to work, which was not usual for him. It wasn't normal for him to work nights. Yeah, that sounds terrible. Yeah, but he was doing work at a Starbucks, so I assume that, like, whatever work he was doing, he had to cut the power. So he had to do it at night when the Starbucks wasn't open. That does make sense. Yeah. All right. I can, I can believe that. I'm buying that so far. Yeah. So he anticipated being home around 10 or 11. Oh, okay. Not like too late. No, but Debbie was a little nervous because like I said, this wasn't their normal routine. So she wasn't used to being home alone at night with the kid. And I get that. I don't like being alone at my house either. That's a big lie. I do like being home alone. (laughs) You can say it. Matt doesn't listen anyway. Yeah. I mean, I like being home alone because I get stuff done and I can do whatever I want. But at the same time, like every little noise, I'm like, the fuck was that? So anyway, Debbie put on a movie for her kids because she was home alone. A neighbor friend came over with their kid and she put a movie on in the living room for the older kids. And she put Lisa to bed in her crib around 630. Oh, that seems pretty early. Well, she's 10 months old, so... No, maybe not. Yeah, is that that early? I don't think it's that early. I mean, maybe a little bit. But she was putting a movie on for the older kids, and then she put Lisa to bed in her crib. And then her and the neighbor hung out on the porch and had a glass of wine and just kind of hung out outside while the kids were watching a movie inside. So the kids' movie night ended around 10, and Debbie called it a night with a neighbor and put the boys to bed. 
you know, got them in their pajamas, did their nighttime routine. And she checked on baby Lisa one more time around 1030 and then she went to bed herself. Jeremy took a little longer at work than he thought he would. Like, I don't know if things went wrong or if he got behind or what happened, but he didn't get home until like three or four in the morning. Ooh, that's a big difference between like 10 and 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I will say plumbing jobs, electrician jobs, like sometimes shit just doesn't go right and it takes longer than you think. So, so he doesn't get home until almost three or four in the morning. And when he got home, he was like a little bit irritated because the house wasn't like shut down how they would shut down for the night. There was a lot of lights on. The front door was unlocked. It just wasn't put down. Like, you know how you do your nighttime routine and you shut the whole house down and you go to bed? Totally. It would drive me nuts if I got home expecting everyone to be in bed and like everything was still on and be like, God. Yeah. Like, I do everything for this place. Yeah. But really, I don't. But that's how I would, that's what I would think. Yes, exactly. So he goes around and he turns all the lights off and then he peeks in at his, at his kids, you know, at the boys. And one of the boys was asleep in bed with Debbie. And then the other one was asleep in their room. And then he peeked in on Lisa to check on her before he went to bed and she wasn't in her crib. Oh, man. So he immediately kind of like freaks out and he runs into Debbie and he's like, where's Lisa? Like, is she in here with you? Like, what's, where's the baby? And Debbie's like, what the fuck are you talking about? She's in her crib. That's I put her to bed. and She's in her crib. And he's like, no, she's not. So, of course, panic sets in immediately. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because this isn't like a three or four year old that like got up before you and wandered out of their room and is getting into something in the backyard. Like she's a 10 month old baby. She can't get out of her crib by herself. Right. Oh, man. But they searched the whole house anyway. Like, well, maybe tonight was the first night she crawled out of her own crib. You know, like, I don't know. So they searched the whole house anyway and the yard. And they even wake up that neighbor that Debbie was hanging out with because they're like, you know, Jeremy just wanted to make sure, like, did you leave her with her? Like, what, you know. But obviously she didn't. She had put her to bed. So they decide pretty quickly that they have to call 911. They're like, we'd rather call 911 and then find her somewhere in our house and be like, oh, we're dumb. We lost our baby, you know. Oh, my God. There's like – and you got to be thinking too. Like there's no way they've lost this baby. Like babies at 10 months don't walk, no, right? Like – They didn't lose. I'm not even sure if they crawl. And right. so like they're probably they like – They do. <laughs> just in total panic mode. Yeah. They run back in the house to call 911 and they always plug their cell phones in in the same spot in the kitchen, like on the counter. And their cell phones were gone. Oh. They weren't there. But luckily, Jeremy had his work cell phone on him because he was at work. So he used his work cell phone to call 911. That is bizarre. Yeah. So, okay. So he calls 911 yep. and goes, hey, our baby and our phones are missing. Yes. And they also noticed that there was a window open, which they said was pretty normal. Like, they leave windows open sometimes. But the screen looked like it had been, like, pushed in. Oh, man. But that was it. No Lisa, no phones, one open window, and a bunch of lights on, and the front door unlocked. Like, that's all they know. So, this is a fucking nightmare. The police search the area, and they canvass for any witnesses that saw anybody sketchy or noticed anything out of place in the neighborhood. But at first, there isn't a lot. Everybody's like, I don't know. It's the middle of the night. Yeah. So the police naturally bring in Debbie and Jeremy because when a kid is missing or murdered, like 99% of the time, it was the mom or the dad. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking, too. But obviously, I mean, not we I don't know. Maybe, but I get it. That yeah, makes sense. Totally. And But they're super cooperative. The police even say that in the press conference. They're like, the mom and dad are giving us everything we need. They're answering all questions. Like, there's nothing hinky here. Like, they were made it clear that they were cooperating big time. The National Guard's brought in. Thousands of volunteers show up to, like, do searches. There's an Amber Alert. The National Guard, really? Yeah. I don't know how they did that, but they did. I kind of thought that was a joke. Like... I mean, I thought they were like, oh, we're going to call the National Guard. And then like nobody actually called. Like who's actually serving in the National Guard, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I have that National Guard station right by my house. Have you ever seen anybody at it? Oh, yeah. Like every once in a while, there's like a shitload of cars there. And my husband's always like, oh, they're doing their two weekends a month, one week a year thing. Yeah, got to be. I mean, I don't think I've ever known anybody who went into the National Guard. Yeah. But the volunteers and the search and rescue stuff, they're searching like rivers, lakes, landfills, the neighborhood, anywhere and everywhere just for clues. Like not even for Lisa, just for like a bib or a sock, like a clue of what might have happened. 24 hours after she went missing, there's still zero sign of baby Lisa. Hmm. So Debbie and Jeremy hold a press conference, you know, the normal where they're like on TV begging the kidnapper to bring her home. 
You know, sure, just like sure. drop her off at a church or a fire station. They're just devastated. Still, nothing comes in, even after the parents' press conference and public plea. So the police start interrogating Debbie and Jeremy, and they sign everything. They're just like, take whatever you want. Take our house, our phones, our cars, everything. Like, just come on in. Do whatever you need to do. Take whatever you need to take. They were super cooperative. The police even asked to talk to their sons, you know, their older children, alone without them. And they're like, yeah, do whatever you got to do. Like, talk to them. Maybe they heard something. I didn't even think about the kids. Yeah. That's, oh, man. I hope it doesn't go down that path. Yeah. I'll, although I don't like the path it's already on, so. Well, I'm just I'm just trying to paint the picture that like Debbie and Jeremy are giving the police everything they ask for, even when they want to interview their young children. Without them, they're like, "Yeah, go ahead. They have nothing to hide." Is pretty much what I'm getting at. They even themselves let the police interrogate and question them for hours on end without attorneys. Like they didn't get attorney. They were just like, "Whatever you need," and they questioned them for like twelve hours straight. Okay, did they? Get anything out of that? Not really, but pretty quickly the police start pointing fingers at Debbie. They interrogate her for hours on end and try to get her to break. They tell her that they know she did something. You know, they do the whole thing. And she never cracks. But eventually, after a lot of that, they decided to get lawyers because they're like, obviously the police are only looking at us. They thought that would go on at first and then the police would be like, okay, they have nothing to hide and they would move on. And they didn't. So they asked for lawyers. (laughs) Eventually. Well, we do recommend that. But not before the police asked her to take a polygraph test. And she does it. She's like, yeah, whatever you want. And she takes the test, which I do not recommend. We do not recommend that. So at the end of this test, the FBI agent tells her that she failed miserably and that they know she killed her baby. What? Yeah. Yeah. Which turns out they can lie to you and tell you that you failed a polygraph test when you didn't. What? Mm -hmm. Why? To get you to confess. Why would they do that? Oh, dude, that's bullshit. Yeah, but it's legal. But she doesn't crash. She's like, well, I don't know. Your fucking test is wrong then because I didn't hurt my baby. You know, she didn't oh, crash. That's, that, honestly, that's mean to do to somebody if she didn't if she didn't fail. That's a mean thing to do to somebody. Yeah. So they also nailed down Jeremy's alibi because apparently he was on video surveillance all night at his because he was at a Starbucks. Yeah, I was thinking that already. Mm-hmm. So he's kind of like off the hook right away, but they really hone in on Debbie and they really try to get her to break. And she doesn't. She's like, I didn't hurt my baby. But that's when the Irwins decide like, okay, we need an attorney. Like they're trying to get her to. Yeah, they've turned on us. Pretty much. That's how they felt was like they turned on us. And they stopped like asking them for, oh, can we search this or can we do that? And they started going straight to judges and getting search warrants and stuff. And they're like, we've given you don't need that. We've given you full access to everything. So they end up getting an attorney and the police immediately tell the media, like in a press conference, they're like, well, the parents stopped cooperating. So everybody knows what that means. Means they did it. Yeah, but it's like they didn't stop cooperating. They were cooperating like crazy until you guys started telling them they failed polygraph tests and killed their kid. And then they stopped cooperating. Right. But they didn't even stop cooperating. They just got attorneys so that they didn't get fucked. They were still cooperating. So, I don't know, that was kind of nonsense. I thought that was like a real strange move, but they literally tried to get the media to turn on them. They were like, well, you know, if they wanted to find their kid, they'd cooperate, and they're not. So, it's like, whoa. Dude, sometimes the police act such like gangsters or mobsters. Like, it's kind of like... Sometimes. Why are you doing this? Like, why are you shaking these people down if they've been super cooperative, if they've done everything you've asked, if they passed the lie detector test? Like, we know this is a hard case. That's why they called you in here, idiots. Yeah. And like, I get it. Like a lot of times it is the parents and they just do need a little bit of shaking down to yeah. confess. Like I get it. That's yeah. I get it to, an, to a point. Yeah. But then in the cases where it's not the parents, it's like, oh man, that sucks because they are still treated like it was the parents, you know? And I don't know in this case if it was or wasn't, but there is certainly no evidence that it was. But I also will say when they took a look at Debbie's story from that night and the more they interviewed her and the more they asked her questions, her story had some holes and changed a little bit. So, man, did I just defend Debbie and it was totally the wrong thing to do? Yeah. No, I don't know that it was the wrong thing, but she didn't make it easy at first because, you know, they they have her tell her story over and over. And it starts with she hung out with the neighbor on the porch and they had a glass or two of wine went to bed at 1030, you know, and then the more and more she tells it, she finally admits, okay, it was probably more like four or five glasses of wine. 
I was pretty drunk by the time I went to bed. Like, she just didn't want to seem like because she was drunk, this is what happened. Right. So she didn't admit at first how much she had drank. But by the end of it, it turns out she drank quite a bit, like more than five glasses of wine. And she was probably- The entire box? Maybe. I don't know. Oof. But she was pretty drunk when she went to bed, or could have been at least. And she does admit by the end of the interviews that she might not have checked on Lisa at 1030 when she went to bed. Oh, really? Yeah. That, but the reason that she said she did was because she always did. You know, you put your kids to bed and then when you go to bed, you check on them. But she doesn't remember actually checking on her. Ooh, okay. So she could have, she could not have. It's kind of up in the air. Right. So for sure, the last time Lisa was seen was 630 p.m. when she put her to bed. Hmm, man. Yeah. So that's another reason why the police are like, why is your story shit? You know, and it's like, because of this exact reason, she didn't want anybody to think what they're thinking now, which is that she was drunk and that's why her kid's missing. Right. Exactly. Well, kind of what we're all thinking, you know? Yeah. But no matter how long they interrogate her or what technique they use, she never cracked like the police thought she would. Like she never was like, okay, you're right. I, I did so like never. She's like, no, I didn't do anything. So at this weird press conference when the cops were like hinting that the parents were involved and weren't cooperating, that's when the media kind of turned on them and the public. Like a lot of people were like, obviously she did something because who gets drunk Ooh. while they're in charge of their kids? And it's like, uh, probably every mom at some point. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot of people that do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, like she thought her kids I'm not, were done. I'm not and condoning it, but there's a lot of people that do that. Yeah, and I mean, she thought her kids were done for the night and in bed, like, if she wanted to have a couple of glasses of wine with her neighbor friend, like, I don't, I mean, I don't think that's why her baby's missing, is what I'm saying. Right. No, I mean, I don't think that's the end of the world at all. Yeah. Then the police bring in a cadaver dog into the house. Would have been a great fan base nickname for the for the record. Yeah, you're still on that, huh? Dude, I think it's so cool. <laughs> so they say that the cadaver dog hit in the house. But then later they admit that cadaver dogs hit on dirty diapers. They hit on them? Like that's what they, like one of the things that they will hit on? Yes. Or- Because it's oh, really? human waste, which is like oh, what they're trained interesting. to detect interesting yeah they're trained to detect like human decomposition and body fluids and all that kind of stuff so they're known to hit on dirty diapers and she was a 10 month old baby so obviously there was dirty diapers in the house so a lot of people dismiss the cadaver dog hit but a lot of people say like that's not a good sign you know that's kind of an argument for both camps whether you think she did something or if you think she didn't there's like an explanation either way hmm yeah, that makes sense. But by this time, it seemed like the community wanted to believe that Debbie did something. Because the alternative is that somebody literally walked into their house and took their baby and ruined their lives in seconds. That's the other option. And like, yeah. like your baby's gone. That's huge. Someone walked into your house. That's a big problem, too. Yeah. So everybody kind of turned on them because it was better than thinking like random strangers just walk into your house and steal your kids. But that may be exactly what happened because eyewitness tips started coming in after people started hearing that there was a baby missing. Three different people said that they saw a man carrying a baby in the area that night. Okay. I mean. Three unrelated people. Yeah. Yeah. But like, okay, like there's a man walking with a baby. That happens too. Of course. But the difference with this man that was walking with the baby was that everybody noticed him for the same reason. Oh. And they said that it, it was kind of a chilly night and he was wearing a white t-shirt and the baby was only in a diaper and it was like 40 degrees outside. Oh. Oh, interesting. And so everybody was kind of like, that baby's not dressed for this weather. Like, and they noticed it because it stood out. E one guy on a motorcycle even pulled over and asked the guy, like, are you okay? Can I, like take you somewhere because that baby can't be out here without clothes on like it's 40 degrees outside sure and the guy said no i don't need help and like just walked away oh mm -hmm. don't like that so one of the witnesses saw this man walking with the baby around midnight like a block away from the Irwin's house and then another eyewitness saw a man coming out of the woods later on that evening and then the guy on the motorcycle saw him at like on the street like at a he was stopped at a red light and saw him and it was all like in the same general area at the same time the reason that they think this is credible and it wasn't just like people who knew the Irwins that were like calling in fake tips to make it seem like they didn't hurt their baby oh yeah was because one of these sightings was caught on video surveillance 
from a gas station. Oh, really? Yeah. What the heck? Yeah, the one where the guy saw the man coming out of the woods. There was a gas station like 100 yards across the road. So you could see the guy coming out of the woods at the exact time that the uh, the guy said he saw him. But the surveillance video is so far away, you can't tell if he's holding a baby or not. But it confirms that he wasn't lying. He literally saw a guy like emerge from the woods. Yeah, that's pretty sketchy in and of itself, isn't it? Yeah. This is a huge lead. Because this is the first time that they're hearing that there's any other option besides Debbie did something. There was also a dumpster fire not too far away from the Irwin's house in an apartment complex. When they got the fire out and like kind of looked inside the dumpster, there was baby clothes in the dumpster. Uh... And the interesting thing about this apartment complex and where this dumpster was is it was literally right on the other side of where that guy came out from the woods. So if he would have like lit that dumpster on fire and then ran through the woods and came out on the other side. But there was no baby in there, so that's no. the positive. No, no, but no, I no. mean, obviously... They're not stealing it to kill it. They're stealing it for a a different reason. So they searched those woods that that guy came out of and the landfill because they were like, well, the dumpster would have gone to the landfill. But what's weird is the dumpster didn't make it to the landfill. Like they lit it on fire and then they caught it. So I don't know why they checked the landfill, but they were just checking anywhere they could think. Then somehow they honed in on a neighborhood thief named John Tanko. He goes by the name Jersey, which... Is annoying. That's a stupid name. Yeah, super dumb. Is it because he always wore like athletic jerseys? I don't know. Or maybe he's from New Jersey. Mm, I guess so. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure. Somehow they honed in on this guy. I don't know if there was tips called in or if they just like knew he was like a neighborhood thief who would like break into pe- He was like a meth guy and he would break into houses and steal phones and electronics and stuff. And so somehow they started looking at this guy and he fit the description that the people saw with the baby. And he was a known burglar and he was staying at a place that was like a block away from the Irwin's house. Oh, Oh, okay. Was there anything to do with like kidnapping or child endangerment or anything in his past? No. But when they do more investigating, they realize that Jersey's girlfriend or ex-girlfriend, they were like breaking up at the time, lived in the apartment complex with the dumpster fire. Oh. So being a known burglar, he may have been casing the house and he knew when Jeremy's truck wasn't there that maybe Jeremy wasn't home. Yeah, but like why would he want the baby? I don't know. But the records from one of the missing cell phones came back. And it was used to make one call after the baby had gone missing and the cell phones had gone missing. Oh, all right. Give it to me. What's that? The call was to a girl named Megan Wright, and she was the girlfriend that lived in the apartment complex with the dumpster fire. No way. 100%. Yeah. Oh, man. Dude. Of course, they interviewed her, and she's like, I know nothing about this, and we're, like, totally broken up. But she did admit that he didn't take the breakup as good as she did. Like, her car had been lit on fire, like, a couple weeks before, and she was pretty sure it was him. Okay, so now this guy's doing a couple things twice. Yeah, All right. yeah. And she did admit that she had mentioned to him that she wanted a baby. So she was worried that maybe he did it to, like, give to her, but she didn't say that he ever did. And she doesn't say that she got that phone call that night. She said that somebody else had her phone and blah, blah, blah. You know, kind of a dumb story. Oh, well, okay, sure. Yeah. But they looked back at all the phone records from her and the Irwins and John Tanko, and they didn't know each other. Like, their phone numbers had never called each other in the history of their phone numbers until that night. What? Yeah, like, it wasn't like they were friends and, like, the Irwins called her. Like. They, there would have been no reason for her number to be on the Irwin cell phone. Okay, then who had her phone? Yeah. And did they know them? Because, I mean... Yes, they interviewed the guy who had her phone. But that's... The new theory is that John Tanko called her that night after he did that, and a man answered her phone. And then maybe he got upset that a man... An- I don't know. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because she said one of her guy friends had her phone. And that guy's been interviewed, and I don't know what really, I don't know the gist of that. So these people are not mm. great. No, this, this this is not great, man. Yeah. So this adds up to John Tanko, Jersey, for sure, obviously, allegedly, yeah. in my opinion. No, uh, what? But We don't know? The police never arrest him. I mean, they do. They arrest him, like, on other things and open warrants that he has, and they interrogate him, but he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they ask the witnesses if they could ID him, and one... One witness positively IDs him as the man with the baby that night, but the other one says that they're not sure. So 
He walked. They couldn't arrest him. They had nothing. But they had one that said, yeah, that's him for sure. Like I know. And they had the cell phone records, but didn't matter. That's what the, yeah, that's way too much to be a coincidence, honestly. Yeah. The case went cold and Lisa's never been seen since. We still don't know anything about this? Nope. Oh my God. That makes things even worse. There was a little girl a couple of years after Lisa went missing that was found in Greece with like a bunch of gypsies or something. She clearly wasn't like their child. She was like a little blonde headed white girl. And for a little bit, they thought that that baby could have been Lisa and they ran all the DNA and, and turned out she wasn't Lisa. Mm, wow. Yep. Who was she? Did they, they like identify the parents? Yeah, they did. And she, I believe she was another missing girl, but she was not from, she was not Lisa. Oh. I don't even think she was American. All right. I mean, at least there's some positive that came out of that. But but every couple of years, they update the age progression photo of baby Lisa. And her parents go on the news on the anniversary of her disappearance every year and show the new updated age progression and beg anybody if they know anybody who looks like her to call it in. How are you supposed to like move forward with your life? I have no idea. How are you supposed to be like, well, all right, next one won't won't go missing. Yeah, like, or whatever. Like, that is insane. Oh, my gosh. I feel like the only way that any sense of normalcy is that they still had two other children they had to raise. So they had to have somewhat of a life for their other kids. But they've never given up on baby Lisa. I mean, they have tried so hard to find her. And now, if she were alive now, she'd be like almost 13. So now they're hoping that someday she's going to do an ancestry test or something like that, and she's going to pop up somewhere. Yeah. No, I I certainly hope so. You know, I know that outlook is not very likely. It's very bleak. But, uh, man. I don't know what the outlook is on infants because I know kids it's very bleak but infants are usually abducted to be sold in like illegal adoptions or to be kept by the person who abducted them as a child right yeah you're right that's true I don't know what the statistics are but I think it's more likely that she's alive because she was an infant when she was abducted rather than being like five or six you're probably right but nevertheless like anytime we do these cases about like this kind of stuff like dude they're hard you you know, they, like, obviously, like, the child death cases are the hardest ones, but, like, these are really hard, too. Like, to put yourself in those parents' shoes and be like, yeah, we have kids or a kid who is missing and gone. We have no idea where. We can't do it. Like, you're so hopeless. Well, oh, and this man. one's really hard, too, because it's not even like it was the 70s or the 80s when it was like, okay, yeah, things just point. happened and we didn't know. Like, this is 2011. Like, there's ring doorbell cameras and there's gas station surveillance. And Like, how did this happen? No idea. I... It's, it is beyond sad. Yeah, it's terrible. So the theories in this case. Theoryland! Yeah, let's hear them. There's really only two theories. It's that something happened to baby Lisa while Jeremy was at work and Debbie covered it up. Or somebody came in and kidnapped baby Lisa. And the most likely in that scenario, allegedly in my opinion, is John Jersey Tango. Yeah, no doubt. So allegedly, in my opinion, that's the one I'm going with, too. If for no other reason, I don't want to believe that a mom did anything to her kid. And this mom, like, I, I don't know if that's a very unpopular or popular opinion, but I just don't get the vibe from her that she had anything to do with this. Like when I see her in, in press conferences or in interviews or something, I just don't get the like, oh, geez, she did something. I don't get that at all from her. We're usually pretty good about picking up on that. So and I feel very bad that if she didn't, the way that they've been under suspicion for so long sucks so bad. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's I mean, honestly, probably one of the most heartbreaking parts of this whole thing is that they've been a suspect in all of this mm -hmm. for so long. Yep. Anyway, that's the story of baby Lisa. So if you know any little girls, we're going to put Lisa's baby picture from when she went missing on our Instagram. And then we'll put up the most recent age progression, which I wouldn't go by. I would just go by if you know any 12, 13 year olds that might be adopted, maybe get their DNA checked. Before we go, I wanted to ask you, do you know what a criminal's best asset is? No. His liability. <laughs> Funny Thank dad you. jokes you have there. Yeah, well, you know, they're coming in hot. All right. Well, I love you. Okay. I love you too. Bye. Bye. This podcast has been a production of Orange Halo Media, LLC, hosted by Grant and Erica. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. To chat with us, go to From Crime to Crime on Instagram, From Crime to Crime on TikTok, From Crime the Number Two Crime on Twitter, or you can visit our website at FromCrime2Crime.com. See you next Wednesday.